Good afternoon. Welcome to Yahoo Finance Plus users and subscribers, that is, and thanks for joining us today. This is Argus Director of Research, Jim Kelleher. Our call today is entitled Argus Investment Strategy the Year Ahead. I'm joined by Argus President John Ede, who will provide Argus's forecast for the economy, stock market performance, and other elements of our outlook. We'll also discuss the outlook for interest rates, inflation, and stock and bond valuation. 12 months ago, the markets were absorbed by a still contested election. Vaccine developments provided hope, the housing market was white hot, and the economy was showing surprising resilience as reopening began. A year later, the medical news is mixed. And although the pandemic is old news, it continues to find new ways to challenge the world and the markets. The Omicron variant arrived just in time to try and spoil Christmas. The Delta variant and vaccine hesitancy have allowed COVID-19 to reassert itself. Reopening continues, and in fact, reopening has accelerated, but it has brought with it bottlenecks in global supply chains. Interest rates are moving up, but remain low, although that could change by mid-2022. And inflation is now running at the highest level since the post-World War II era. Argus President John Ede will provide his fundamental forecasts in a dynamic environment. Key topics include GDP growth, earnings, jobs and unemployment, inflation, interest rates, Fed policy, and more. Argus is calling for a moderating economy after a rip-roaring economic recovery. Corporate profits have risen to new highs, but growth could become more challenging. Valuations are concerns are real after the market surge in 21 which build on 2020's gains. We'll conclude our presentation with our themes for the year. John Ede and, and I will enjoy, uh, we'll be ready to take your questions and uh, touch on these many themes and topics as, uh, as your questions drive us. So at this point, let me turn it over to John Ede. John? Yeah, well, Jim, thank you so much. And, and we thank everybody from the Yahoo community for joining us this afternoon. Um, we're grateful for our partnership with Yahoo Finance and uh, grateful for the opportunity to spend some time with you all today talking about what we expect to see in the markets in 2022. Um, as Jim mentioned, Argus is a fundamental independent research organization. We've got a, a team of 20 analysts based in New York City. Our analysts cover approximately 500 stocks in all of the major economic industries. Um, and, and we'll definitely be reviewing some of their stock ideas later today. Uh, but before we get to those stock ideas, we're going to do something called taking a top-down approach to investment. And as Jim said, we're gonna talk about the economy, interest rates, markets, sectors, and finally stocks. And that's the way that we've done things at Argus Research since our company was founded by an economist back in 1934. So let's, let's move through the slides um, for just a moment. We'll take a look at the performance slide. And this has been a very good year for stocks. Um, a lot of green here. The blue chips, S&P 500, are leading. Value and growth are doing well. Even the small caps are up, up mid-teens. And bonds um, are down as interest rates have drifted higher a little bit. As far as the sectors are concerned, uh, impressive market breadth here in 2021. Last year, it was all about the technology and the communication services. Um, and healthcare really leading the market. But here, again, every one of these 11 sectors is positive year to date um, in, in the US markets. And by the way, those are the sectors that we have analysts following, um, each one of them. And across the globe, um, US is leading performance, but there is recovery in the Eurozone, in some of the emerging markets. And, and, and even in Japan. So a good year for stocks generally across the globe in 2021. 
And now let's move on to 2022 and our eight fundamental forecasts for 2022. Um, I'm not going to read each of these, but I will refer to them, and Jim will too, as we walk through the presentation today. But the general sense is we're going to have a positive year for the economy, but the growth isn't going to be as strong as we saw in 2021, which was a recovery year. We're going to have a positive year for earnings growth in 2022, but again, not as strong as 2021 when stocks when earnings increased about 45% on average. And as for the stock market, well, I'll save that for a, a little bit later. But let, let's move on to some of our charts on the economy. And, and, and let me once again say, we're very grateful for our relationship with, with Yahoo Finance. And, and these topics that we have here are topics that we discuss and you can read about and follow along and argue with us um, on the Yahoo Finance Plus uh, service on yahoofinance.com. A lot of these come from our daily market watch report, which comes out uh, before the market opens every day with an economic or market topic, uh, a stock idea. And, and, and here we're going to start off with our outlook for the economy. And we're going to talk about the consumer sector, which is the most important sector of the U.S. economy, accounting for about two-thirds of uh, overall GDP output. So for the U.S. economy in 2022, we are anticipating about 3.5% growth in GDP. And the growth rate that we're going to come to in 2021 is about five and a half percent. So impressive recovery in 2021, good growth in 2022, um, especially when you think about the long-term US economic growth rate of just about 2% in the decade prior to the pandemic. We're gonna have a, a, a good year with economic numbers in 2022. It's just not gonna be as strong uh, as the rebound that we had in 2021. And we do look for the consumer sector to be the driving force uh, for economic growth next year. One of the main factors driving the consumer sector is the jobs environment. So we've got the unemployment rate here down to about three and a half percent prior to the pandemic, up toward 15% early in the pandemic, and rapidly falling down to 4.2%, just about where it was pre-pandemic you know, here at the end of 2021. The uh, employment situation has improved a little bit faster than I had anticipated. I think faster than the Federal Reserve has anticipated. And we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, and there's still more progress to make with the unemployment rate to get it back to that three and a half percent that we were prior to the pandemic. Now, the good news for those seeking a job and that's in our, our next chart here, the job openings and the unemployed. That orange line is all of the job openings in the economy. And at this point, there are more job openings than there are unemployed people, which is that blue line. This is a pretty rare occurrence. We don't see it very often, uh, but that's where we are right now. So a pretty good likelihood that the unemployment rate is going to push below 4% at some point in 2022. Uh, that's the jobs. The uh, balance sheets of American households are in good shape. We're looking at that here with the household debt levels, and we're charting the service payments as a percent of disposable personal income. Going back 40 years, that average service payment as a percent has been 11%. It's down to around 9% now. So savings rates have improved for American households. And that might be a little bit of, of pent up demand ready to work its way back into the economy with um, uh, spending on durable goods once more and on services in the quarters ahead. And then the last consumer chart we have here is consumer confidence. 
and and this is something that we think of as almost a uh, lagging indicator that when consumer confidence is so high, well, all the progress has been made and it's just not going to go much higher. So there aren't many more positive surprises. And what we see here with consumer confidence is that it fell off a cliff prior to the pandemic, recovered a little bit, um, and now is slumping again as uh, inflation worries take over and as this new variant of COVID-19 emerges. So um, consumer confidence has turned lower. We actually think that's a positive thing for um, the economy and for the stock market because we do expect consumer confidence to turn around and head higher back up toward those all-time highs and boosting consumer spending along the way. So um, those are some thoughts we have on the consumer sector, the most important sector of the economy. Now let's move on to the next slide. We'll take a look uh, at a couple of other economic elements here. One is the housing market. And there can be no doubt that the housing market recovery really helped the overall US economy recover quickly from COVID-19. And um, at this point though, looking forward, we're starting to see a slowdown in the housing market because conditions have been a bit too positive. And what I'm talking about is that blue line there, the monthly home price change, which for the last three months, according to the Case-Shiller Index, home prices have been increasing year over year at a 20% rate. So that's well above inflation, highest we've seen in 40 years. Um, and consumer, the prices are, home prices are getting a bit pricey. So you see that reflected in some of the other housing statistics. Existing home sales are slowing down, new home sales are slowing down, and the, the metric that we've plotted here is a forward-looking metric that is building permits, right? Because home builders have to get the building permits before they can just build a house. And building permits have been trending lower as well as those housing prices have been higher. There's not a bubble in the housing market. It's not going to blow up. It just isn't going to contribute to GDP growth the way that it did in 2021. And that's one of the reasons we anticipate somewhat slower growth next year than this year. Uh, the second chart here is a quick look at the supply chain and all the backlogs of, of unfilled orders at the manufacturing level, at the consumer level. And you can see at the far right that those curves are, are headed higher. Um, that means the value of orders keeps increasing. And at this point, manufacturing orders are about 11% above their historical average, and cons unfilled consumer goods orders are about 60% uh, above their historical average. So a lot of people are waiting on a lot of things in the supply chain. And that's starting to drive up prices, which we showed earlier, is having an impact on consumer confidence. Um, we think that this problem is going to be resolved over the next 10 to 15 months. There is another indicator we follow called the uh, ISM supply chain index. And that had been at all time highs when um, supplies were at all time highs. And that has moved lower over these last three months. So starting to see a little bit of, of breaks in, in the log jam here. And, and I, I do think that the supply chain isn't going to be the problem in 2022 that it has been in 2021. So in the lower left-hand um, corner, we have a chart that shows our GDP forecasts through 2022. And you see those big swings in 2020. That was 30% down, 30% up with the onset of the coronavirus. This past summer, when Delta was ravaging through the case figures, we saw GDP growth go from 6% to 2%, 6% in the second quarter to 2% in the third quarter. Here we are coming with Omicron. We don't think that's, we think that impact on the economy is going to continue to be less as we go through these new variants. 
Um, we're anticipating solid growth in 2022. 3.7% is a great number against the historical record. It's a little bit lower than we've seen in 2021. Uh, but a lot of that has to do with unwinding these supply chain snags and um, you know keeping the housing market going. And then just to put the US GDP outlook in context, um, US GDP growth is going to be among the world leaders in 2022. Uh, we think that a lot of the trading partners in Europe and Japan are facing deflationary conditions and negative interest rates, which point to slow growth. And then in the emerging economies, there still is a lot of concern about healthcare and vaccination distribution and, and, and vaccination. So uh, a struggle there to recover back to uh, a, a better health level. So we do think that the US economy is gonna be uh, the economy to focus on in 2022. And with that, I'm going to turn the call back over to my colleague, Jim Kelleher. Thank you, John. So I, we have a couple charts on this page uh, on inflation, and I think there's no bigger topic uh, in the market right now. The Fed has a dual mandate to keep uh, ensure full employment and to use its policy tools to, main, to keep inflation at a healthy 2% growth rate. Some investors would argue that the Fed was so focused on getting the economy back in up and running that it left its stimulative tools in place too long and inflation is out of the bottle. Well, we'll see how that goes. But as you can see in the chart on the upper left, most inflation indicators are running well above that level. And that red line is the 2% line. And you can see many of these are running well above uh, where they normally need to be. And just uh, today we heard uh, producer price uh, inflation at the final demand level running at uh, levels we've, we've really never seen before. Wages are also rising, but at least consumers reinvest higher wages in the economy in the form of consumer spending. But with wages rising at about 5% rate, it's actually running below the growth in inflation right now. Now, if we go a little further down that chart, though, we do see the core gauges of consumer inflation, such as the, the core PCE from GDP, the core CPI, and the 10-year uh, tips exchange rate, for example. They're averaging about 3.5% not too much above the Fed's target rate. Um, in the slide on the upper right, we can see digging deeper into the parts of the US economy, we can see where that inflation lies. And, and we particularly notice that used car prices are way up because the semiconductor shortage has made new car production, uh, hard. it's hard to get a new car now. And energy prices are up sharply because oil companies reduced price, production during the pandemic, and then a demand has come back faster than anticipated. While food and housing costs are higher, they have risen at a more moderate pace. And one interesting anomaly here, John, is that medical costs, which is something that consumers have been complaining about forever, is the slowest growing part of the inflation uh, environment right now. Now, our third chart is on inflation expectations, which is the important takeaway. Uh, we, our one-year outlook for inflation is high, but, you know, including what we saw earlier in the year is what we're seeing right now. By three-year, we think inflation starts to settle down at about the 4% range. And five years from now, investors anticipate that the Fed will have bought inflation back down to around 2%. Even inflation does run at 2% in coming years, however, it will be tacked on to higher current levels, adding to strains on consumer finances. Now note that not all inflation is the same. The most severe inflationary periods in the US in the past 80 years were after World War II and the Korean War. Inflation after those periods were driven by surging demand pushing up prices much like at present. We also saw inflationary periods in the 70s and 80s that reflected oil price shocks, where higher consumer spending on gasoline crowded out spending on other consumer goods. The oil price shocks in the 70s and 80s created stagflation that lingered for years, and we think the current period of inflation is closer to the past, uh, I'm sorry, to the post-war periods when real demand was strong. And inflation in those periods returned to normal more quickly than in the stagflation era. Now let's go on to our next slide, talk a little bit about interest rates. We can see that the Federal Reserve balance sheets in the upper left is at historic highs. That's due to the first, the, uh, the initial tapering program after the Great Recession, followed by the COVID-related quantitative easing with the Fed buying 
120 billion in treasuries and mortgage backs per month. Now the asset side of the balance sheet is above 8 trillion. The Fed has started to taper its asset purchases program by 15 billion per month. We believe that could double to 30 billion per month and we might hear about that as soon as tomorrow when the Fed concludes its December FOMC meeting. We now think the Fed will be finished with tapering by spring 2022. Reduced bond demand by the Fed could raise long-term rates a bit, which would further cool off the economy inflation and re restore some steepness to the yield curve. Now on the upper right, we see the Fed funds target rate. The Fed's main tool to, uh, to, to uh, control or fight inflation is to adjust the Fed funds rate at the short end. The central bank took the Fed's funds rate to zero at the start of the pandemic, and it hasn't budged. Now, unemployment is on track to reach 4% ahead of expectations, and we don't think it will be too long before the Fed hikes the Fed funds rate. We believe the Fed wants to get in front of potential problems, such as COVID prolonging the supply chain crisis, so we now look for two rate hikes in 2022. We then look for perhaps two to three more hikes in 2023, and we see the potential for the Fed to lift the FUD, Fed funds rate to the 1.75 to 2% rate by, say, 2024. And looking at that chart bottom left, the U.S. Uh, debt to GDP ratio, and that's, here's another one that's an historic high. It's jumped to 120% and it is set to jump again if the infrastructure spending plan is implemented and the Build Back Better fiscal plan is approved. These are all time high levels. But no one expects the U.S. to default on its uh, obligations. With interest rates so low, interest expense is at the low level of total government spending. And slower Treasury issuance as the economy normalizes and amid continued GDP growth could begin to bring this ratio down. But let's face it, this GDP to debt, rate, debt to GDP ratio will remain elevated. And then wrapping everything up, here's our yield curve outlook. You can see that in the uh, orange color there. We do look for the yield curve to shift higher, and importantly, that should add some steepness to the curve, with long-term rates increasing more than short-term rates. And now let's take a minute to, on our next page to talk a little bit about evaluation in the market. In our first slide on the upper left, we see that earnings has recovered to all-time highs along with the U.S. economy. After an earnings decline in 2020 related to the lockdown, earnings for 2021 rebounded by over 40%. Looking out to 2022, we expect solid growth, but in the 10% range, as most sectors will have fully recovered by sometimes next year, and the comps get a little harder. 10% is still good growth, and we think it to be expected to be driven by above-trend GDP growth, management's focus on margins, and budget, uh, benefits from digital transformation. Now, our, on the upper right is our asset allocation model that in which we look at our, our so-called bond versus stock barometer. This model takes into account earnings forecasts, interest rate forecasts, inflation trends, GDP, and current bond and stock prices. When all these are factored in, the two asset classes are at fair value when compared against each other. Neither one is a screaming bargain versus the other, as we saw at certain times. For instance, over the past 10 years, stocks appeared undervalued compared to bonds, or you look at the 90s, when you can see when bonds were undervalued compared with stocks. Stocks may be overvalued on earnings, as we'll discuss below, but they do not appear overvalued against other asset classes. So the earnings slides on the bottom we see are the two valuation models, and we can see that both bonds uh, are, are, below fair, are above fair value, that is to say the yields are below fair value, meaning bonds are above fair value, and also the S&P 500 is above fair value. According to the model, bond yields are about 50% below fair value, and stock prices are as much as 50% above fair value, based primarily on GDP, EPS growth, and rising rates and in inflation. So again, we think stock prices are high against earnings, but are reasonable compared to other alternatives. For our final valuation commentary, we see fair value in the S&P 500 at about 3,800, which is 23% below the current level. However, we think the market is more than 23% overvalued because the other inputs in our model are going the wrong way. Inflation and interest rates are rising, while jobs growth may slow, which would impact GDP. The market has had a good year in 2020, 
21, but was able to record strong gains before negative news hit at mid-year. That included inflation, supply chain, interest rates, and then later in the year, Omicron. 2022 will begin with all those challenges front and center, and 2022 is a midterm year, which is historically not a good year for stocks. But at the same time, earnings are rising and the economy is reopening. On balance, we see a, four, a positive, though likely below average year for stocks in 2022. And now let me hand it back to John. Jim, thank you for that overview on our interest rate outlook, inflation outlook, and then the discussion of the market valuations. So let's talk about some risks that investors are going to face here in 2022. And, you know, we never have really left that uh, risk environment that we entered when um, COVID first hit. We, we look at the volatility index to get a sense of what's going on with risks. And prior to COVID, the VIX volatility index was around 10, 11, 12, near all-time lows. And then it shot up toward 80 in the early stages of the pandemic. And it has never gotten back down to those pre-pandemic levels. So there is still a lot of fear in the market. I'm looking at the VIX volatility index right now, and it's right about at, at 22. So double the volatility that we saw pre-pandemic. And, and you know, we just need to le le learn to um, live with these risks. And when you're at this high volatility level, I think what we've seen is that there's a potential three times a year for a 5% pullback in stocks. And we just saw one, you know, right around Thanksgiving time with the uh, onset of the Omicron uh, variant. So, um, you know, be ready for those. And we've seen the in in recent years, those have been good buying opportunities. You know, nothing to really be afraid about. If you think about Jim's valuation chart, the valuations could use um, a, a little bit of breathing room. Um, a, a more serious correction, we found that over the years, the market endures a correction about once every 18 months. So, you know, if, if you just want to take that literally, we had the 30% um, sell-off in stocks in March 2020. So that should cover us for another six to eight months. Uh, but you can't really take it literally. Um, it, it could happen at any time, particularly with the volatility index uh, where it is uh, near 20, near 22. So some of the things that we're going to be keeping our eye on this year will, of course, be new variants of COVID-19. And we've told you how we're thinking about Omicron. It's a shock, uh, but not as big a shock as Delta was, and Delta was nowhere near as big a shock as uh, the initial onset of COVID-19 back in, in March 2020. So uh, there are steps that governments are taking. There are vaccines. There are treatments coming out. I, I, I don't see Omicron you know, derailing this, this um, return recovery in the economy that, that we're we remain in inflation and supply chains um you know the fed is accelerating its the steps it's taking to remove the support that it put in place for the economy that helped the economy recover the fed is meeting today and tomorrow there will be an announcement from the fed tomorrow afternoon chairman powell will then take questions from the press um as Jim said, we think they're going to be accelerating their program to uh, eliminate their asset purchases, their quantitative easing programming program, tapering that. And they're also going to push forward uh, those federal funds rate hikes, you know, maybe two into 2022. Uh, and we'd only been thinking of, of one. So uh, the Fed is, is looking to take advantage of uh, that to, uh, to keep inflation under control. The market thinks it's gonna take a few years to get inflation under control. That was that expectations chart. 
But again, if the market were really worried about inflation, then bond investors would put the 200 basis point cushion they usually do on top of the CPI and we core CPI, and we would have a 10 year treasury yield now of 6%, and it's below 1.5%. So I think there's a lot of confidence that over time the Fed is going to be able to. Um, you know, bring inflation back down. Uh, another risk for 2022 would be if oil prices continue to spike higher. Now, I'll tell you, uh, this time last year, when we were giving our forecasts for 2021, we did not think that oil prices were going to spike. We did not think that was a risk. Um, we were wrong about that. But with peak oil demand, you know, out five to 10 years, um, at most, then we just don't see oil doubling again in 2022 as it did in 2021. It was more of a, a supply issue this year, as Jim indicated. Um, demand is probably going to be steady and slowly declining. So once the supply is, is back in alignment, uh, I think oil prices remain under control. Debt to GDP, we talked about that. Deficit spending, we've got looks like about $3 trillion of spending programs working their way through Congress right now. I guess one of the things to think about these programs is, as opposed to the early pandemic programs, when the checks were cut immediately and a trillion dollars was spent in you know a matter of three or four months, these $3 trillion, this $3 trillion program is uh, expected to be implemented over 10 years. So it's not going to be like a, a gush of money, uh, you know, coming out of the treasury and, and raising up debt. Uh, but assuming that these programs are approved, they're going to have to be paid for. And one of the, the um, payment schemes that they're talking about is taxing corporate share buybacks. So um, you might see an adjustment in the market of companies reducing their share buybacks, which can prop up earnings per share, and instead increasing the growth of, of their dividends, you know, which, which right now aren't targeted for, for more taxes. Stock valuation levels and earnings disappointments, uh, we've talked about that, and Federal Reserve uncertainty, um, you know, we're uncertain today, heading into a Fed meeting tomorrow. And NASDAQ is down 1.5%. So these are some of the risks that investors face in 2022. And now moving on to our outlook and some of the justifications for our outlook. There's a chart of the VIX volatility index, still high compared to where we were uh, prior to the pandemic. Uh, there's a chart of the annual returns through the presidential cycle. Jim talked about that. Year one is a good year. We're wrapping up year one. You know, we're probably going to do better than that 14% average in year one of a presidential cycle. We're heading into year two. Year two is a more challenging year uh, for stocks, as you see, you know, mid single digits, not mid teens returns. So that's something we're facing. And, um, you know, it's, it, it's no secret that there is a pretty substantial divide uh, in politics uh, among the population. And as we come into the midterm elections, uh, I'm, I'm sure the rhetoric will be high and uh, the debates and, and the concerns will you know, be on the forefront of everybody's minds as they always are. Um, that could weigh on stocks as it has in the past. And then in our uh, bottom chart, we are plotting annual stock returns against uh, what the 10-year treasury bond is yielding. And we do that for a couple of reasons. One, um, you know, the main asset allocation decision is stocks versus bonds. And when bond yields are higher, you know, it just makes sense that investors would move some of their assets out of the riskier stock asset class and into bonds. And when bond yields are lower, well, that, that can make stocks more attractive. Further, when bond yields are lower, 
uh, that helps corporate profits because interest costs uh, aren't as high as when interest rates are higher. And third, when uh, the 10-year Treasury bond yield is on the low side, that helps stock market valuations because investors value future profits and discount them back to net present value. And if you're discounting them back at a lower interest rate because uh, regular interest rates are lower, then your um, net present value is going to be higher. So, so bonds have an important uh, are an important factor in how we think about stock returns. And so, deciphering this chart just just briefly, these are returns going back to 1960. So, 60 years of of returns. And on average, since 1960, stocks have returned 12%. Certainly not bad, um, and one out of every five years has been a down year for stocks. So double-digit returns, but 20% of the time, you're going to have a negative year in stocks. Since 1980, and we point out 1980 because that's when Ronald Reagan became president and deregulation kicked into a higher gear, and that's when Paul Volcker became uh, president of the Federal Reserve and started to uh, – reduce inflation dramatically, stock returns have been better, um, 13% on average, and down years one out of every six years. So uh, with interest rates you know, on their way down from 1980, better returns in the market. And then if we just look at all of the years where the 10-year yield was below 4%, we find that the average return for stocks was 16%. So low rates typically correlate with higher stock market returns. And only one of every 10 years was negative in the stock market when interest rates were low. So we've talked about our interest rate outlook. We think the 10 year is going to move up, um, you know, two and a half, 2.75% in 2022. We've talked about our earnings forecast is positive. Our economics forecast is, is positive. Uh, we have these high risk levels, and we also have the uh, annual uh, year two of the presidential cycle. So the easy call is just to say, well, since 1980, stocks have returned 12% on average. We think it's going to be an average year. We actually think it's going to be a little bit below average year. And as Jim said, not a negative year. But our, we haven't set an S&P 500 target yet. We'll do that closer to the end of the year. We'll see where the dust settles in 2021. But we think returns are going to be more in that 8 to 10% range um, along with earnings growth. So um, I, I think with that, why don't we uh, take a break here from the presentation and take some questions, and then we can come back later if there's time and talk about sectors and, and themes. Thank you, John. So one of the questions we've had coming in, and I'm gonna take this one, John, um, and, I'll, and I have one for you next, and that is, um, why is that midterm year bad for stocks? And you know, what, what can you say about it? Well, I, I would, you know, one, one thing we've observed, you know, and again, we've been, uh, looking looking at this four year cycle for quite some time and 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 in the election uh, in the first year of the presidency uh there's optimism generally the new president is is pushing forward his policies and as we've seen in this even though this is an extraordinary time we are still getting the normal sort of fiscal stimulus you get when a president is is pushing forward policies um and then as the second year comes, there is a little bit of that, like a bit of a hangover because it's very difficult for political parties to achieve their aims. And you, you're, you're more aware of the things that didn't work rather than things that did work. And then we do have this, uh, this is not the first time the US has had a rancorous divide between uh, uh, GOP and the Democrats. So I would say, um, there is concern that this will be another bitter bipartisan election. But when you when you step away from the current environment and just look at how the market behaves, John, uh, what we've seen over the years is that when one party controls the White House and one con party controls the Congress, 
uh, the, we get a little bit of gridlock usually, neither side can really advance their agenda, and Wall Street tends to like that. Now, the, the, currently, uh, the Biden administration holds the White House, the Senate, and the Congress, but we know those majorities are razor thin. And on average, in a midterm year, the sitting president loses 50 or 60 seats in, this, in the House and, and loses a few Senate seats. So if we merely get the normal pattern uh, in 2022, you would see the Congress tip over to one side of the aisle and you'd see the presidency on the other and we'd get that kind of gridlock. So that's generally uh, not something that Wall Street is afraid of. Wall Street kind of likes gridlock. Uh, but but generally, by the time that election is over, the year's nearly over as well. And that's one reason why the market uh, is not uh, necessarily one of the better years in the cycle. So, John, we had a, a question come in on uh, uh, growth versus value and, and, and large versus small cap. Can you, can you talk a little bit about on where we see those sort of themes? Uh, yeah, sure, Jim. Happy to. And and, and those are, are good questions. Um, on growth versus value, this is something we get just about every year. And I will tell you that for the past 10 years, I guess 11 years now, um, growth has far outpaced value. Prior to the Great Recession, growth and value really rotated back and forth with you know, growth leading for a little while, and then say, you know, that the, the dot com uh, bubble bursts and value recovers. And prior to the pandemic, they were really even as strategies, you know, over several decades. I mean, pr prior to uh, the financial crisis. But since the financial crisis, which resulted in interest rates moving down to historical lows. Growth has has vastly outperformed value, and it goes back to what we were talking earlier, where you know you're able to value growth growth stock valuations appear more reasonable when interest rates are low because their future cash flows come back into net present value at higher levels. So growth, 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 growth. However, in 2021, you probably remember Jim value shot out to the lead and energy stocks energy we've seen energy fall from eight percent of the stock market to two percent it was deep value and and energy popped up and the banks popped up uh with interest rates starting to rise so you had some value sectors really providing leadership um through the first of the year uh, through the first half of the year but in the second half it's we, we've gone back to the technology stocks and the communication services stocks and the healthcare stocks. And the last I looked was that growth had pulled even with value and even pulled ahead a little bit. And as long as we're going to have low interest rates, I just think that's going to be the dominant factor favoring growth over value. Not, not absolutely, not, not like you don't want to have any value in your portfolio, because value is where you can get some, some good dividend income in a low interest rate environment. But Jim here, generally favoring growth over value. And, and the same is true with um, US and, and international. US stocks have been the, the dominant performer for about 10 years now. And, and while we saw earlier, Jim, that some of the international countries are, are having decent years I, I still don't think the jury is out on on their recoveries, you know, with their 10-year yields negative, um, facing deflationary conditions. Um, so in the portfolios that we build, we try to add some international exposure, but that's really down like the, the 5 to 10% range, Jim. Our, our, our focus right now is on you know, where we think the fundamentals are better, and, and, and that's in the uh, U.S. economy, not the uh, other global economies. And, and, John, it looks like you're on a roll, so I, I have one more for you. And basically, you're, uh, with our inflation chart, we, we pointed out that our three-year outlook for inflation is, is above the, uh, the Fed's target range. And our listener wants to know, um, in that kind of uh, elevated inflation environment, um, 
what sectors to, you know, I, I would say that, you know, Argus recommends that we be invested in all sectors, uh, all 11 sectors, but what are some of the sectors that do well in inflation? And, and I will point out that that would include some wealth in the ground sectors, uh, such as, uh, you know, materials and, and, you know, metal and mining part of materials and oil, because uh, the, the, the value of those goes up uh, as those asset prices go up. And then also financial services is a sector you want to be fairly uh, represented in uh, because the widening of net interest margins. But my question for you, John, is uh, you mentioned some confidence that the global supply chain crisis would not be as bad in uh, 2022 as it was this year. What, what are some of the signs we should be looking for and what gives you confidence that the crisis may have hit its peak? Well, one, Jim, was that ism supply chain index which looks like it hit an inflection point uh late in the summer at you know something close to 70 and, and as you know with the ism indexes jim anytime they're over 50 you know they're indicating uh either robust economic conditions or you know something that, that that's overheating but since peaking at about 70 over the past three months Little by little, they've moved back down toward the 60, which is still a, a high level, but it, it's trending in the right direction. So, so that's one factor. Another factor, Jim, is uh, what's going on deeper in the labor market. And in particular, I'm thinking of the labor force participation rate. Uh, for the longest time, let's say for 20 years, that was 63%. And then since the pandemic hit, that's gone down to 61%. A lot of people have left the labor force. Uh, that's reduced the supply of workers. That's increased the demand for qualified workers from companies. They've pushed prices up. Uh, I, I think as these variants become more and more manageable, I do think that the workers who left the labor force are going to re-enter the labor force, and that will give you some slack. Um, it, it will reduce some of the wage pressures, and it will also, you know, fill some of the jobs that are unfilled right now and are um, delaying, causing delays into this supply chain. Plus, um, you know, I know at the federal government level. We've we've read about different meetings that leaders in the administration have had with um, you know members of the the, the ports and, and the supply chain networks, you know, trying to tackle the problem uh, at, at at the government level. So uh, several things I think are are working in favor of of, of getting some of these um, bottlenecks eased. You know, it's going to be over the next few months. It's not going to be right away, but heading in that direction. Great. That's that, that's a comprehensive answer. And and John, we have some themes at the end of the deck here, and I was just kind of wondering what secular themes do you think might be important in uh, in 2022? So, so Jim, let, let's take a second and, and go through these last two slides. Maybe we'll move okay. to the, the sector slide. Why not? Okay, so um, we have a report on Yahoo Finance Plus called the Sector Watch. It's a, a research report, and in that report, we give analysis of each of the sectors and our best picks uh, in each of the sectors that we use in our different portfolios. So Jim, as you said earlier, um, here are the 11 sectors. We like some of them. We don't like others. A couple of the ones we like are really more secular ideas. This is where demographics are heading. This is where innovation is heading. This is where our economy is heading, and that is in technology and, and healthcare. Um, and those are two of the bigger sectors in the market at 28% and 13%. Um, those are secular sector calls. And then some of the more cyclical calls, um, you know, as we think inflation is going to stay elevated for a while, that guides us toward basic materials. 
uh, as we think that the high deficit levels will keep the dollar under pressure. That puts us to an export sector like industrials. As we think the yield curve is going to widen uh, with long-term rates heading higher than short-term rates in 2022, that takes us to financial services. So we have some secular and cyclical calls. And to read more about it, definitely check out our Sector Watch report on uh, the Yahoo Finance Plus site. And now let's head over to our last uh, slide here. And this is the themes for 2022. Um, let me point out that some of these themes are, are more cyc cyclical in nature, like the confident consumer. We talked about that early on in the conversation today, how we think consumer confidence is going to recover. Um, there's a, a cyclical theme in there for the steeper yield curve. And that's going to help out some of the banking and insurance stocks. So we've listed some of the stocks that we like. Now, now let me tell you, for each of these stocks that we've listed here, we just have the tickers, but um, we have analysts following each of these stocks. Our analysts rate stocks buy, hold, and sell. All of these stocks are on the buy list, and you can read in depth about any one of these stocks on the Yahoo Finance Plus site um, by clicking on research reports and the little box opens filter reports by symbols and put in the symbol and you can read our analysts latest thinking on any of these tickers here and on hundreds of others. But Jim, so some of the secular themes that we talk about um, and we're thinking about in 2022 include um, dividend growth, right? We touched on that earlier in the presentation. We think that's going to be important next year uh, because stock buybacks may be more expensive. So we've identified a number of stocks that every year, year in, year out, increase their dividends at a double digit rate. So those are good ones to think about with the theme of dividend growth. You know, innovation is a, another um, secular theme. We think the U.S. economy is the most innovative in the world and leading um, innovative sectors include technology and healthcare, as we cited. But it's not just new products that are exciting about innovation. Uh, the U.S. companies are some of the best managed companies in the world, and the management teams are coming up with innovative ways of reducing costs, innovative ways of uh, expanding into new markets, innovative systems to uh, make their operations more efficient. So innovation can mean more than just new products. And we've got a list of companies that we think are highly innovative in the US. And I'm gonna put in another plug, Jim, for Yahoo Finance Plus. We have uh, theme portfolios on this dividend growth theme, on the innovation theme, on the ESG impact investing theme. So if you wanna read our in-depth views on these themes, and, and see the stocks that we think fit these themes. Again, you need to go to Yahoo Finance Plus into report type and then thematic portfolio. And that's where you'll see some of these secular themes discussed, Jim. And, and John, some of these technology related themes really uh, are, are transformational and they really require deep analysis at the company level. And on the site, you're gonna find, for instance, 5G goes mainstream. Well, people may be thinking, well, gee, 5G, I mean, you know, the first iPhones, it's been around for a while now, but the reality is it's a chicken and egg story. You need to have the networks that are really delivering, you know, low band, mid band, and ultra high band uh, signals. Uh, and then you have to have the devices, more sophisticated devices out there. So when you turn on your phone, you actually see that it's accessing a 5G network. That's a slowly developing thing, but there's many, many ways to play it. We think it's gonna play out for many, many years. And here's all these stocks that you can read about on the site and the ways in which they're exposed and the way in which they can grow. I mean, if you're a Qualcomm, if you're a Broadcom, you're seeing a lot more dollar content per device in a 5G phone than a 4G phone. Uh, if you're one of these uh, suppliers like uh, 
Verizon or AT&T, uh, one of the service providers, you're seeing an opportunity for greater uh, revenue per user and maybe even displacement of traditional uh, broadband access with wireless access. And then similarly, the AI data center, this is a really uh, complex and unfolding sort of theme, John, artificial intelligence in the data center, it's all part of the cloud era, and the ways in which uh, these companies, companies that many investors are only getting to know now, whether that would be, uh, you know, an NVIDIA or maybe a, a, an optical pipe provider like Sienna. And, and so, again, on the site, you're going to find lots of information on these individual companies and the way they play uh, in these fast unfolding themes. So, John, do we have any more questions or are we, are we, kind, of, uh, we kind of winding down at this point? Uh, Jim, I see one in here. Let's touch on crypto um, and and Bitcoin. Um, so Argus covers the 500 stocks. We cover asset classes. Um, we don't at this time have a buy, hold, or sell rating on Bitcoin or on cryptocurrency. Uh, but we're watching it closely, and we're watching it from three different angles. One is from the angle of a consumer. And, you know, Bitcoin was supposed to make life easier for consumers. No middleman, no, um, you know, foreign exchange translation. Uh, but I can't imagine anybody using cryptocurrency to buy a gallon of milk, a gallon of gas, even a Tesla. I just don't think there are many consumer issues right at this time for, for cryptocurrency. Uh, so consumer is one area. Investor is is another area. And boy, is is Bitcoin volatile, right? 60,000, 40,000, 30,000. It's, it's, it's been, you know, to the moon and back just in uh, 2021. But the whole category, Jim, has grown. The let's call it cryptocurrency as a market class. It's about three trillion dollars, and you know what I think about uh, cryptocurrency is is like when it becomes as big as gold, because a lot of people find a way to include gold in their portfolios, a gold fund, uh, you know maybe two or three percent, um, just as an inflation hedge and as a potential growth asset. Now, Bitcoin is at three trillion. Gold is at 10 trillion. So bit, the cryptocurrency would need to triple before I think it would really start to show up in a lot more um, diversified portfolios. And, and before it triples, you know, the uh, regulators are going to come in and they're going to try to to put more rules around it. Um, you know how much capital you need to have back. Um, at, at, at the crypto bank's balance sheet, uh, rules for stable coins. So that's going to that's gonna play out, but that's probably going to take, I'm going to say, three or four years before, you know, crypto starts to make a 2 or 3% um, appearance in diversified portfolios. And then the third way to play it, of course, is as a trader. And wow, if you like volatility, you know, that's where to go. But good luck deciphering you know what china's going to decide next about bitcoin manufacturing or what elon musk is going to tweet out next about about bitcoin um, i do think that the investing is the way to go but i i think it's a little bit early uh, to start adding it to portfolios you know even at the you know kind of one to two percent area so those are our views on on crypto right now but there are a handful of companies we follow jim uh, that do have exposure to crypto. Yeah, we certainly have companies we follow like IBM with exposure to blockchain. So there are more conservative ways to play that sort of technology. So that about, uh, we're running out of time. Uh, thanks everybody for, for, for dialing in today. And thanks to Yahoo Finance Plus for allowing, you know, for hosting us today. Again, lots of great content on the site, a lot of great Argus content, other content on the site. Uh, so we're going to, wish everyone happy holidays and thank you again and uh we hope to hope you uh, we hope to uh be back on here at some point in the future so have a good day now goodbye